Today, as we uh, are all gathered here today, I want us to, uh, I want for the sermon, I want us to look at a couple of uh, meaningful words. At least I believe they're meaningful to you and to me. Uh, the words that I want us to focus in on a little bit here today is number one, redeemed and reconciled. Because for you and me, those two words hold monumental uh, significance. Because we know we have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And because of that, we also have been reconciled to God. And that's an important factor, and I want, to, want us to look at that a little bit. But if you, you say, what is the difference between the words? And there is a difference, just so that we know. Redeemed, you know, if we're thinking about now, this is just a definition. I'm going to give you the, you know, the dictionary definition just briefly, and then what it means to us theologically, because there, there is, uh, you know, some application uh, in that area. But redeem means to purchase back. Sorry about that. We don't have a, a lapel mic, so uh, I'm going to lean on this one just a little bit. But to purchase me or to rede redeem means to purchase or buy back. It means to ransom, and it means to liberate or rescue. And then, you know, and they go, there's a lot of other de uh, definitions of it, too. It means to save, to pay the penalty of. In theological terms, and this would be important to you and I today, it means to rescue or be rescued and delivered from the bondage of sin. And from the penalties of God's violated laws. That's what it means. By obedience and sufferings, you know, by obedience and sufferings in the place of the sinner. And suffering which is accepted in lieu of the sinner's disobedience. So that is what redeemed means. We'll, we're going to read some scriptures about that and, and look and see how these things apply to you and to me, especially as we are just a few days away from Passover and Days of Unleavened Bread. Uh, ones that I hope for you and for me are, you know, just incredibly uh, wonderful and meaningful and significant and one that we spend a lot of time in preparation and thought and, and uh, anal analyzing and examining not only ourselves, but just in appreciation to God for the sacrifice that he, you know, gave. His, he, he, he gave his, us his son. To reconcile. Now, this is a different word than to redeem. To reconcile is to call back into union and friendship the affections that have been alienated. And we know that, you know, we know the scripture in Matthew that says, you know, if you go to offer your gift before God and you have ought against your brother, what does it tell us to do? It says, leave your gift at the altar and go be reconciled. You know, whatever it is that alienates, go get that taken care of and to get rid of the, that and be reconciled to one another. And certainly in Scripture for you and for me, it, me it means it is the means by which you and I, you know, who are all of us are sinners, are reconciled and brought back into a state of acceptance and favor with God. You know, and uh, we'll read some of those scriptures. So that kind of gives us a, you know, just a brief, a brief. So let's look at how scripture uses these two words uh, this morning. And uh, that will be real brief. And then I would like to read and conclude that this with a, uh, with a story that I want us to uh, talk about. If you'll turn with me over here to the book of 1 Timothy as we start thinking about this, and um, we will have an intermixing here of redeemed and reconciling, but I just want us to think about the scriptures that apply to you and me about these two words just briefly here this morning. In 1 Timothy, the second chapter, we read this in verse 3, it says, or verse 5, it says, For there is one God... And one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. 
And of course, we know that there is just one God the Father. You keep your finger there and, and turn with me over here to the book of Ephesians, if chapter 4. We understand this principle, but I think it's good for us to have it reemphasized to us. Yes, there is one God. In verse 4 of Ephesians 4, it's, or let's actually just start here in verse 3. It says, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. For there is, and we're going to look at some ones here. There's one body. There's only one body of Christ. You know, uh, it doesn't matter if there's organizational lines. You know, that doesn't identify, you know, the body. The body is identified by God's Holy Spirit and those that have it. That is the body that's referred to. And we hope that all congregations, all flocks, whatever, uh, whatever group that, that, that it might be, that they are all part of the one body. But there is one body and there is one spirit even as you were called in one hope of your calling. A lot of ones. This is a, a great thing. Oneness. We're all one in God. One body, one spirit, one hope of your calling. One Lord. One faith. One baptism. And one God and Father of all. Who is above all and through all and in you all. And so when we're reading here in 1 Timothy chapter 2, it says, for there is but one God, or there is one God, we're talking about that, the Father, the God. And there is one mediator, the Lord. One mediator between God and man, and that man, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And there's a lot of things that are said here in this verse, if you just think about it. You know, it doesn't, you know, why does, there ha why does it necessitate that there be a mediator? Well, because of sin, correct? And we read this, if you'll, you'll turn with me over here to the, to the book of Isaiah, chapter 29, uh, 59. We understand that, you know, even if you wanted to take this back to the, to the book of Genesis in the very beginning, you know, we understand the fall of man. And there came a, you know, when sin entered in, then we were separated from God. And there had, that, you know, necessitated then that there had to be somebody that, or something and somebody that would reconcile and redeem mankind because of sin. And, of course, that applies, you know, in the sense of mankind in general, but also in Isaiah 59, uh, beginning in verse 1, it says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened uh, that he cannot save, and his ear, neither uh, is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But notice what separates us, you know, and, and honestly, we know this. We, if we analyze and we think about, you know, our spiritual lives, it says, But your iniquities have separated you from God. And that's, what's, that's what puts a, a gulf between us and God. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Now, we, understanding and knowing that in the significance then of the Passover and the days of unleavened bread and the meaning of that and the meaning of the sacrifice that, that Christ made just becomes monumental when we recognize, you know, the fact that it's our iniquities that have separate, uh, separated us. And, uh, you know, sin has put up a real barrier between God and mankind. And God <clears throat> hates sin. And it says he does not dwell with sin. And he, you know, and he does not, uh, he won't have anything to do with it. He does not abide it. You know, and the question might be, as we think about that, how are, what are our attitudes and, and our general thoughts about sin? Do we have the same hate for sin and love for truth that God has? Well, of course, I don't believe that any of us do. I believe we seek it, uh, which, again, I think is part of the, the marvelous benefits of these days of unleavened bread as we humble ourselves before God and we meditate upon the things that we have been given. We actually, you know, put ourselves under a microscope and we, we analyze what we say we analyze what we think, 
we analyze our actions, and we analyze our conduct. You know, basically four areas. We, we look at and, and we're trying to analyze those things to see how do these things apply and how do we become at one with God in these things. So it says, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. That necessitated, you know, in thinking about the sin that entered the world, it necessitated that there had to be something done to save and to reconcile us to God. And as we're thinking about that, I want us to turn over here to Leviticus. We're going to go to Colossians. But first, I want us to look at a scripture here in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. As we think about the sacrifice of Christ and we think about our lives, we think, as we humble ourselves, as we approach these days, it says, and this is a verse 10 and 11, and this isn't the first time that this is mentioned. You'll, you'll find a uh, subject of blood mentioned earlier in the book of Leviticus. But in verse 10, it says, and there's specific instructions, and whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn among you that eats any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eats blood. And will cut him off from among his people. Now, you know, sidebar here. You realize? Have you noticed how many crazy um, um, uh, vampire shows are out these days, where they want to suck your blood? And you think about the blood suckers, and then you, rec you you look at this and you say, "How ridiculous can this be?" You know, you think about it. God says. Hey, from the very beginning, blood, you're not supposed to eat blood. And the concept that there would be blood-sucking human beings is just ridiculous. For the life of the flesh, verse 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. And then this statement, for it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. It is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. And then over here in Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, keeping in mind we've just read in Isaiah that it is our sins that separate and realizing that it is blood upon the altar that reconciles, that makes the atonement. We read this in Colossians chapter 1, verse 19, For it pleased the Father that in Him should all the fullness dwell. Well, who is that? Verse 15 says, talking about Jesus Christ, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creation or creature? For by Him were all things created. You know, and you think about, you think about that. Here we have, you know, the Word who was with God, who was God, and it's by him that all things were created. Of course, I don't think we fully understand how the Father and the Son work together uh, and how, you know, it says that, uh, you know, God created all things. Yeah, and the Word is the one that did it. You know, how sometimes I just don't think we comprehend, I don't think we, we can in this physical understand the relationship between the Father and the Son in the things that they do and how they work together. Uh, you know, um, and, and that could lead to some very interesting discussions, but that would be a, diff a different one. But it says, for, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and is invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body. How many bodies are there? One. He is the head of the body. What is the body called? The church. The ecclesia, who is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. For it pleased, verse 19, again, the Father, that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross. Remember, we're, we're, we're considering the words redeemed, and reconciled. And when it says here made peace, that's what we're talking about. He's having made peace through the blood of the cross by him 
to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say whether they be, they be things in earth or things in heaven. Very interesting. And we certainly know, uh, you know, Romans 3 tells us that in verse Romans 3, 23, it says, All have sinned and come short of the glory. I think we all recognize that fact and we certainly believe it. And we know that redemption is through Jesus Christ. There is redemptive qualities in all of the uh, Passover symbols, and it is redempt Christ is our redemption. And then over here in the book of Ephesians, we also read this. I hope this is meaningful, and I believe that by the time we get to the end of this sermon today, maybe we will really focus in. These are very meaningful things to you and to me. They are to me. I know they are to you too. The, the importance of what we're discussing here, this, the importance of the sacrifice of Christ and how he uh, redeems, has redeemed us and has reconciled us. It says in verse 13 here of Ephesians 2, But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were afar off, and remember we read, what is it that puts us away, puts us afar off? Well, it's our sins. He says, sometimes you that were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. You know, there's those that, you know, those that are afar off and those that are near. That's what makes up the both there he's talking about. For he is our peace who, is, who has made both one, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even of the law, even of the law of commands obtained in ordinances to now make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereof. It's interesting that we are redeemed by Christ, but we are reconciled unto God. And how important that is for us, because we do not want to be at enmity with God. And, you know, the, the fact that Jesus Christ in the things that he performed, allowed there to be the opportunity for once again slaying that enmity that we might be reconciled and we might have access. It says, uh, continuing here, and that you, he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Boy, that's a good thing. That's a good thing, that we have access to the Father. And, you know, these days, nothing more poignant than these days that we are coming upon that emphasize what Christ had to go through so that we might have access to the Father once again. It does say over here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it says that we, there, is a, there was something that took place, this, re, this accessing the Father doesn't come easily, and it didn't come without a huge sacrifice. And in verse 20, it says that you're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And we are bought with a price. We know that, you know, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And we have been redeemed so that we can have those sins forgiven. Probably one of the greatest lessons that we can learn during the Passover season, uh, I believe, each year is just <clears throat> how much we need God and Jesus Christ in our lives. Just how much we are dependent upon them. Because, you know, we, we don't earn salvation. We don't earn anything. Salvation is a free gift. What he does require of us, though, is obedience and that we follow him. And, of course, it says we're rewarded based on, upon the things that we do. 
And he loves, you know, the good works, and those are important things. But we were redeemed, and we have been redeemed, and Peter tells us in chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, that we are redeemed not with corruptible things. But beginning here in verse 15, it says, But as he which has called you is holy... And I guess I preface this with basically uh, all of us preface this with everything that we think and that we do. That as, he's, as he is holy, so be you holy in all manner of conversation. You know, and that word also means conduct. Because it is written, and this is a Leviticus 11.44 if you want to f- go to that. Be you holy for I am holy. And if you call on the Father who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work, he says, tells us, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. You know, now that's not the terror and, you know, being scared and afraid. It's respect. It is lifting up holy hands to the oracles of God and, you know, you fear to disobey. You, you respect that we love and respect God's way so much. That we would fear to do anything, you know, just like you kids. You know, you, you kids fear because you don't want your parents mad at you. You fear to do something that would make them mad at you, right? And so you show them respect by what? Obeying and following their guidance and instruction. Because if you don't, then you ought to fear, you know. You might get out the big paddle. Um, but it says, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear or respect, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things. And I think this is the point of all of the sacrifices that were done in the Old Testament. All of those sacrifices, all of the blood that was spilled, all of that blood that was upon the altars, all pointed to something in the future. You know, to the things that, to the sacrifice that Christ would make. But it says that we're not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversations received by the traditions of your fathers, which was a big issue, you know, back in the time of Peter's, you know, Peter's time. We're not redeemed with corruptible things, but this is what we are redeemed with, with the precious blood of Jesus Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And as we go through this spring Holy Day season, you know, part of the lessons that we learn is that, you know, that lamb that was put up on the 10th of Nisan was a beautiful, pure, unblemished lamb. And it was kept to the 14th. And then, you know, that's all to as an image and representation of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, who was without blemish and without spot. He never sinned. That's how he can be our atonement. That's how we can be redeemed and reconciled. Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you and for me. And that's how we are redeemed, by that precious lamb. And then you think about that lamb. He's taken up and kept to the 14th. And then he was slain. And that was the Passover meal. And it was that blood from that lamb that went on the doorposts for the children of Israel that enabled the destroyer to pass over them when he went when the destroyer came and God slew all the firstborn it was the blood of the lamb and all of those things hold such monumental meanings for us as we think about the things that Christ suffered the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot and then it says this in Hebrews chapter 9 
In verse 11 of Hebrews 9, it says, But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building or not of any physical building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And we know verse 22 says that almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no remission. For, uh, verse 23, it was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in the heavens should be purified with things, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figure of the true. You know, those were all shadows. Those were all pointing to something in the future. They were pointing to him but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. And we know that he sits there making intercession for you and for me. And that as a lamb and as a man, that it says he, that he was tempted in every point like you and like me, yet he was without sin. And that he knows because of the things that he went through, he knows how to intercede for us with the Father. And He knows what to say. And He knows, and you know, I can imagine some of the conversations. Well, God, I know He's hard-headed, but maybe why don't we try this and see if this doesn't work. I think those things go on. I think there's some of those conversations that go on between God and Jesus Christ. But it says, continuing here, Yet not, uh, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year. Of course, we know that on the Day of Atonement. For then must he often have suffered it <clears throat> since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world has he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. As it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. And I have to kind of concur with what Larry was saying earlier uh, because I was at the funeral yesterday of, of Charles Black. And, uh, you know, I look around that room at all of us that are getting old, and, you know, we're all going to go that way. It's inevitable. It is inevitable. It's appointed unto men once to die. But it's our choice how we live it. It's our opportunity to do what we should. It's appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sins unto salvation. And then we have this scripture in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse six, uh, 14 through 16 that I'd like to read before I read a story to you. And I hope this gets us to thinking about what God the Father and Jesus Christ have done for us and what the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, I hope, hopefully means for each of us because it's personal. You know, it's personal for you, each of you. It's personal for, each, for me individually. And uh, it, 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 to me, it's a very humbling time of year and it's a very um, moving time of year for me because of the sacrifice, the things that were done on your and my behalf to redeem and reconcile us to God. It says in verse 14 here of Hebrews 4, Seeing then that we have a, high, a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. You know, sometimes we find ourselves 
that we are not touched by the feeling of each other's infirmities as much as we ought to be. It's my opinion, just my opinion. But I think that that is a vital thought process that we be touched by the infirm by the feeling of our uh, of each other's infirmities. Jesus is a high priest that is very much touched with the feeling of our infirmities and that he is very much in tune with the things that we go through, each of us. But was in all points tempted, like we are, yet without sin. And then verse 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And so this is a, a wonderful, this season, this season is so wonderful with the, you know, incredible magnitude of meaning for each of us. And uh, I, I think it's good for us to stop and just reflect for a little bit each year about these things. I would like to tell you a story today. I'm going to tell you that this is a uh, graphic story. But sometimes I think we need to really consider, and you'll understand what I mean by this. This is a story today about a man named Mark. I'm going to tell you straight up that the story I'm about to, tell, to re relate to you isn't a true story. And I also have to, to tell you that I did not write this story. I was given permission to use this story. This was uh, written by an, an elder in the United Church of God. Anyway, he let me use it. But um, it isn't a true story. It's not, it's based on, but it is based on factual events. And Mark isn't his real name either. As a matter of fact, when we first read about this man, we don't, I don't believe that his name is even mentioned. But as for the sake of this story, let's just call him Mark. If you choose to retell this story, which you certainly have the permission to do at a later time, you can use whatever name you want. But for today, let's just call him Mark. It was a very beautiful spring morning, and Mark was walking to work, as he did every day. There was still a chill in the air. It got cold at night this time of year. But he thought, ah, the day will warm up nicely. The sun was rising and there didn't seem to be a single cloud in the azure blue sky and he smiled to himself when he had overheard some people say that there might be a chance of rain today. There was a soft breeze and the hills were sur surrounding the city were ablaze with color. Ah, it must have been springtime. The, gain, the grain in the field was beginning to ripen, and as he walked along the street, he was aware of the familiar shops and houses. He spoke to several of the housekeepers, shopkeepers as they were preparing their wares for sale. He knew many of them by name and exchanged greetings with them. Looking out at the fields and up on the hills, he could see evidence of his work. Now, he wouldn't deny that there were some pretty good carpenters in town. They built sturdy, good quality houses and even some elaborate government buildings. And he knew that there were men who could take a block of marble or granite and chip it away and smooth it and polish it until they had a solid, unmoving block of stone, you know, to look upon a very resemb uh, remarkable resemblance of an animal or even of a person. Yes, there were many good workers here in town, but, but there, for the entire world to see up on the hills, he thought to himself, was proof positive of his handiwork. Mark loved his job, and he was good at it. He had gone through a long, very long apprenticeship program, and now he was considered to be the top of his craft. While he really enjoyed going to work, he knew that not many people were like him. And as he turned the corner, he saw a young boy on the way to school and nearly, who nearly ran into him. Look out, Joseph, he cried out. He's late for school again, Mark thought to himself. The familiar sight of Joseph running to school brought a smile to Mark's face as he remembered waking up that morning. He had looked at his wife and brushed aside some of her hair that had fallen down over her forehead. 
and he gave her a gentle kiss on the cheek, and she smiled and stirred ever so slightly, making herself a little more comfortable. As with Mark, his wife doesn't have a name, so I picked out one for her. We'll call her Mark's wife. <laughs> As he got out of bed that morning, he patted her tummy that was getting bigger by the day. Maybe this time, he, he thought, it will be a son. Not that anything was wrong with daughters, mind you. A mental picture of his two beautiful daughters filled his thoughts. Their wide brown eyes and flawless complexion often made people stop and do a double take when they saw them. And their hair, he often accused his wife of using some special lotion to make it shine like it did. Coal black and shining. Nope, Mark loved his daughters. But still, he was really hoping for a son. He wanted a son so he could do things, you know, like maybe take him fishing. You know, you don't have to catch anything when you go fishing with your son. Just the idea of sitting on the shore of the lake, listening to the ripples, lapping on the sand, sometimes really hoping the fish wouldn't take a bite. He could see himself teaching his son. Would they name him Mark Jr.? He looked forward to teaching him to be able to saw a board and to drive nails. They could build things together. His thoughts drifted to the things that he and his son could do. Yep, girls were okay, but a son. As he crossed the street, he seemed to shift gears into a more purpose purposeful stride. Have I t told you or mentioned to you that Mark liked his job? He had worked hard and he had, he had been given one promotion after another. He had a nice house where, in which to live. He had a loving and faithful wife, two beautiful daughters, and another one on the way, and life was good. And Mark took care of himself. He ate well. He ate regular meals and worked out as much as, as often as possible to keep himself in good physical shape. He had to. His job demanded it. He always felt that that was one of the s secrets of doing a good job. As he approached his workplace, Mark lifted his eye eyes toward the sky and thought to himself, yep, it's going to be another beautiful day in this beautiful city. To Mark, another work day was about to begin. There had been countless ones before, and he was sure there would be many more just like this in the months and years ahead. He entered his workplace and was greeted with some of the men who were getting ready to leave. And Mark was working the morning shift that was one of the perks he was given for doing his job so well. As usual, he was one of the first ones to get there for the morning shift. But he did love his job. But I think I've already told you that. He checked with his supervisor to see <clears throat> what jobs had been scheduled for him. Other day shift workers came in and men who had been working all night left for home. So he went to where he stored his tools, selected one that would, he would use. He inspected it for wear and for tear and for damage. Good tools make good jobs, Mark always said. And when he was satisfied that everything was in order, he walked over to his first job. Flack! Mark's workday had begun. Mark or as he would be more formally introduced, Marcus was the chief lictor for the Roman occupiers of the city of Jerusalem. And he had begun scourging one Jesus of Nazareth, who some people claim to be the king of the Jews. And Jesus was standing there naked except for a loincloth, his arms were thrust above his head, his hands tied in two rings suspended from above. From the ceiling and his feet were shackled to the floor. And Mark walked slowly around him, making mental notes, deciding where the next blows would strike. The whip in his hand had a comfortable feel to it. It was well balanced. He had taken care to make sure that the sheep's bone and the iron balls were securely tied to the leather thongs. And while the tools were important, 
What was imperative was to know what you had to work on. The men he saw came in all sizes and shapes, and you had to take into consideration how tall they were, how old they were, how much they weighed. Some were skinny while others were fat. You had to watch out for the fat ones. You'd think they could withstand the lashings, but all too often their hearts were not very strong. And just one blow too many on one of these fat men, and you could bring them to a fatal heart attack. And that wasn't his job. It was extremely important that men survived the scourgings. After all, the sentence was the prerogative of the Roman court. Mark's job was to make the criminal suffer, to bring him to half-death. And Jesus looked strong enough to Mark, healthy and physically fit. After he had examined Jesus and was satisfied that this would be just another task, one of the long strings of successful jobs, he walked behind Jesus and slowly lifted his arm for the next blow. Flack! Jesus recoiled as the leather thongs bit into his back. The iron balls caused immediate bruises to appear and some of the bones cut deep into his flesh. Slowly and very methodically, Mark raised his arm again and again to deliver one excruciating painful blow after another, the cat of nine tails singing in the air, and the blood now flowed freely. Mark moved to one side of Jesus and struck more blows. He made sure that every part of his body felt the sting of his whip whack. Jesus couldn't move, but Mark circled, delivering one blow after another. Thwack. And still, Jesus never uttered a word of protest. Thwack. And then it was over. He knew just how far to go. He never counted the number of blows. See, it didn't matter to Mark. And there was none of that 40 stripes save one for him. That was for the Jews. Romans had no such law and limitation. He didn't care how many blows it took to bring a man to the point where just one more blow would be fatal. He looked at Jesus one more time. He was bruised and cut and bleeding from head to toe from the cat of nine tails Mark had used on him. He walked over to a basin and began to wash the blood from his hands, from his arms, and from his chest. As he was washing his face, he smiled as he heard the soldiers taunting Jesus, even dressing him up, pretending he was king of the Jews and giving him a crown of thorns and a reed for a scepter. He turned his attention to the whip, removing pieces of flesh, and began washing the blood away. He thought, sure is a beautiful day. Perhaps I should take my wife and girls on a picnic this afternoon. The guards took Jesus away, and Mark turned to his next job. What would it be this time? A thief, a robber, a murderer? It really didn't matter to Mark. He wasn't a sadist. He was doing his job. When his work was finished for the day, Mark stepped out of the praetorium and started home. And he normally had to protect his eyes from the sunlight at this time of year, but he was startled to find that the sky was dark and getting darker. He glanced at the hills where he had seen his handier, handiwork earlier in the morning. There were still some bodies on stakes, decaying and rotting, even being devoured by vultures and other scavengers. And he could make out quite a crowd at one spot. He couldn't entirely understand what they were saying, but he could, t could tell there was a lot of yelling going on. Well, so much for that. If the Jews wanted a king, they could have him to look at. He smiled as he thought, they won't like what they see, though. Mark was lost in his thoughts, and he had no idea of what he had done that morning, the 14th day of the Jewish month of Nisan. 
It was just another day on the job for Marcus as he continued on his way home, and he had no way of knowing that he had played a fundamental role in fulfilling what the old prophet Isaiah had spoken and written about Jesus Christ in his Isaiah chapter 52. And I'd like us to turn there, Isaiah 52, 14. Verse 14 says, And many were astonished at you. His visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Imagine that about our Savior. His visage marred beyond immediate recognition from a scourging. And then Isaiah 53, verse 4 says, Surely he has borne our griefs, and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him as stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He didn't know, talking about Mark, that Peter, the disciple who had vehemently denied Jesus, or even knowing him, would write several years later, in fact, some 30 years later, what is found over here in 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse 23 and verse 24. Verse 22 said, Who did no sin, sin and neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. Makes you wonder. Did Peter recite this from the book of Isaiah, or did he know this because he was there watching? Makes you wonder. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, and by whose stripes... You are healed. And of course, you and I, we all know that that was just not another day for Mark either or for anybody else. Mark didn't comprehend at that moment, but his life would never be the same. As for all of us that are here today, that day day changed our lives as well. In the days ahead, we're going to rehearse the events of Nisan 14 as we observe the first of God's annual holy days here coming up, the ones that are listed in Leviticus 23. And we're going to think back to the Passover in Egypt when God led his people out of Egyptian bondage. And we're going to realize that that was a real special day. And we'll think about the last Passover that Jesus kept with his disciples That also was a very special day. And we should remember the day that we realized God was calling us into his church. That was an exceptional day. And we should be very thankful for the knowledge and understanding that we've been given. And we should never, ever, ever forget the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made. Willingly gave his life for us that we might not only call on him for healing but that we might have a never-ending future with him and his father in his father's kingdom because we have been reconciled and redeemed.